We are ready. Is it? Okay, it is ready, okay. Go on. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to America. Good evening to Greece. We continue our lecture with the sixth lesson of Hellenic education. And right now I give the floor to the professor, Mr. John Hadzopoulos. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Coordinator. And uh, welcome to the Hellenic education lecture, lesson number six. The previous lessons are on the YouTube, and here are the addresses. In today's lesson, we repeat uh, some uh, topics we covered in the last lecture, and uh, also we are going to cover uh, things like computers, artificial intelligence, and digital image. In the laboratory, Eleni has prepared um, a dream in the waves by Alexandros Papadiamandis. We are going to discuss this literature part. Now, last time we talked about uh, how to define in a practical way the limits of uh, mid space of virtue and uh, we gave this example for a person without physical limitations trying to raise the foot to pass an obstacle and we found out that um, over here there is a clear definition about the boundaries of right and wrong and uh, we talk about the neuron structure of human brain, which uh, gets uh, with the repetition gets trained. And the first time maybe someone who hasn't ever passed an obstacle like this to have a false step, but next time it's going to do better. And finally it's going to be without any problem passing the obstacle. Also, over here we may say that the wrong and right coexist and their boundaries are located at the point where the error value is below a threshold limit and this defines the mid space of uh, virtue or the acceptably correct. Also the mid space of virtue may be the error variance and includes the average like this arrow you see here and the error variance that defines the limits. There is also an unlimited ways to pass the obstacle within this mid space of, of virtue. And this gives the alternatives that define the freedom someone has. And uh, if someone has a false step, then could be attributed either to be uneducated or to do on, purpo on purpose, uh, which is uh, deception or bias, we may call it. Then uh, we talk about the limits of the external balance and we calculate it to be plus or minus one, as you see here. Then we talk about the error distribution diagram of an ideal society. And in one axis, we put the human error and in the vertical axis for a particular value of the human error, how many people commit that error. Also in the location of zero, we may, may say that uh, uh, the people they are in this location, they have um, full amount of uh, 
error with positive sign and error with a negative sign that adds to zero. But that doesn't mean that they have always zero error here. Also, the real structure of the society looks like this. Oh, the average of errors may be me sabo here is not zero. And uh, there are groups with uh, various biases uh, and the distance from the me sabo here, the me I, you see they are the biases of the groups. And uh, the destructive power of a group is equal to the amount of the people multiplied by the bias. If there is symmetry, we have peace. If uh, the sum of the biases is small, the absolute value of the sum of the biases is small, then we have stable peace and symmetry, we have stable peace. And the purpose of the education is to minimize the bias. We talk about uh, what causes uh, prejudice, uh, the ideology, parties, etc., and who maintains the prejudice, and are those they use it uh, to divide the rule, the media, etc. Here, then we talk about that the 0.5 percent of the population. Uh, holds the uh, owns 41 percent of the world's wealth and this is totally out of balance and this is why we face all these problems today and people they are not educated to have a measure of uh, say to to, de to to define what is wrong what is right this is actually evil to happen and people they do not understand because they are not educated. The result of it is that this elite that owns this uh, world uh, wealth are capable of uh, control the power, the government and the opposition of the government. They control the electoral system, the education system they audit the financial system and the banks. Uh, we must understand that a percentage of uh, the average citizens effort in almost every state goes into the pockets of the lenders because all the states, all the countries, they own money to the lenders. They control the media, control the multinational corporations, they control high technology and biotechnology, control the health system. And uh, we have this uh, bad result uh, in this uh, situation we are living today. They control war and peace, and we see that also, and the clergy. Also, we talk about this uh, in the case that uh, one entity commits always zero error, what's happening? Then if we use this function, uh, Y is the correct or the virtue and X is the error, the X goes from zero to plus infinity and pro from zero to minus infinity, then if we give uh, values to the X from minus infinity towards zero, the curve, one uh, y is equal one over x goes from asymptotically towards the minus infinity. Well, given to the x values from plus infinity towards zero, then the curve goes towards plus infinity. That means in the location zero, we have a virtue or a correctness of this entity from, from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that uh, is not could, could not be to any human being, uh, could be to a supreme entity. And uh, 
In this way, an important property of the Champrem uh, tight is revealed first time using mathematical analysis. This means that uh, we are indeed children of the same God and that we have God within us and we can reveal uh, him by researching like in this particular case. It shows the importance of mathematics in enhancing the and expanding the human intellect. The humanities must uh, understand and uh, the importance of the mathematics and uh, emphasize their application to the analysis of philosophical and humanistic structures. The education system needs to improve the teaching of mathematics, taking into consideration that good mathematicians are usually theoreticians and fail in the teaching of mathematics. Now let's go into the informatics now, because the high technology is also a, a, a tool that we use in uh, for education, as I will show to you also in the next uh, in the next lecture. We are going to talk about the about the curriculum in all levels of education. Now imagine a padlock that unlocks a defined with a defined numeric combination. Uh, I hear an echo. Do you? Ellen, shut, shut one of your computers, Ellen. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, that's okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, talk about the computer. The computer is a very simple machine and it works like the padlock that uh, unlocks with a specific number. If we, or we may say in numeric combination. Any other combination cannot unlock the padlock. The computer operates using the same method and uh, we are going to develop be below the structure and the architecture of the computer, how it works. Actually, the computer operates with the binary codes that have a combination of one and zero. For example, this binary here is a binary code. What's happening? The computer is composed of the central unit that you see here, CPU, central processing unit. Then there is a bus that connects the central processing unit with the random access memory, RAM. And the input output controllers here, hard disk, uh, mouse, keyboard, uh, Ethernet, uh, speakers, etc. Now, in the heart of the central processing unit, there is a clock that generates a uniform code like this, which may be a tic tac or uh, on off or high voltage or low voltage and be high voltage the one and low voltage the zero. This uh, pulse here is a regular, is considered a regular signal with a sequence of one zero, one zero, one zero, like that. And it's uh, having a, a frequency of several gigahertz, billions of uh, circles per second. How the computer works, this is the architecture. And uh, if uh, we want to, to, do, to, to do any task, we have to modulate this particular uniform code generated by the clock to a specific code. Instead of being 101010 to be 1101 
I mean a specific code there. This code is uh, generated, is modulated, the clock uh, uh, code is modulated either using a program that having binary instructions or data or pressing uh, the keyboard or uh, the mouse or with any of these devices can be altered the uniform code into a specific code. And the specific code running within the computer circuits could unlock any of these devices that matches the code. We have here in the central processing unit, the registers, the arithmetic and logic unit and the control unit, the random access memory and all these peripherals. Let's see how now the computer works. The computer knows how to do additions and move data in, at high speeds with mega gigahertz uh, speed. Um, let's uh, say that we want to make to add two numbers. The way it works is we have to put a program that does the addition and that program is uh, binary codes residing they have to go into the control unit. So the control unit sends a code to get a number from the hard disk and put it in memory in location A. And another number from the hard disk to put in memory location B. And then another here of the program code tells to bring this to uh, memory locations and put it in two registers here and another instruction here that's the fourth instruction tells to add these two registers to a third uh, register and uh, put uh, the result in the memory location here C you see here C and then there is another instruction to take the result from memory location C and print it into the printer. That's how the, the computer work. And all these instructions here, they have a binary operation code. Also, there is a, high, a, a language that operates instead of using the code, we can use language instructions called assembly language or machine language that actually works like put A in, uh, uh, register one and, and things like that. But uh, each uh, such an instruction has an operation code, a binary operation code. And here in the control unit, we have these binary codes to unlock like the uh, padlock, send you know all these codes here and unlock uh, various devices to move the data and, does, uh, and uh, execute the task we want to be executed. If we have a higher level language like a basic, actually we use only one instruction like in uh, English language, print A plus B, for example. All right, and this includes all these instructions. So such a, a higher level language has to have an interpreter or compiler to translate this simple expression into this complicated operation code, the binary code instructions to be executed by the computer. That's how it works. So in this way, uh, we have uh, the coding system. Usually the information in the computer is 8-bit, call it byte, and we work with such information with bytes. And uh, with 8-bit, we may generate between the third in the eighth power it is equal to 256 different codes and this is usually the codes of the letters and symbols on the keyboard the bus also the computer could uh, be of have a width from 8 bit in the beginning of the computers and then uh, 16 bit then 32 bits and today the the bus is 60 bits 60 bits they go all together so it's very fast moving with gigahertz uh, speed with three bits we may generate in the third power 
eight different codes and you can see them here. Here is with three bits, all these codes, they are different. And these are the digits of the octal system. With four bits, we generate in the fourth power 16 different codes. They, they are the digits of the hexadecimal system. Hexadecimal system is very important because with two bit, two digits of the hexadecimal system, we may uh, define a byte for four bits. It digits makes eight bits with two two digits. You probably in many times if you take a look at computer memory, you will see symbols like uh, these digits and these alphabetical characters that uh, they define the memory uh, locations. Now, we already said that, that the control unit sends the codes to all the devices that unlock do uh, unlock the, the, the devices and perform the task. Now, if we want to write a program for the computer, we can uh, create an algorithm. The algorithm is a sequence of steps followed to solve a particular problem or perform a particular task. If we want, for example, to write a program to put in these uh, text boxes two numbers, number A, number B in these text boxes and uh, do all these kind of five operations and the result uh, is printed in this text box. Okay, we have to uh, create here the Visual Basic 6 I use myself. Gives you the uh, ability to create uh, command buttons like this uh, six buttons, all right? Five here and one here. Behind the, each command button, you can write code. What, uh, when you press the button, what will happen, okay? And uh, what we want to do here is to put these two numbers and do all these operations, okay? Add the two numbers, subtract them, div uh, multiply them, divide them, or take the square root of their product. Now, to do that, so we can write uh, an algorithm like in this one here. Here is the analysis and the algorithm. The algorithm is start, uh, enter, we put the two values in the text boxes, A and B. And then here we are the buttons we press, the five uh, bottoms, okay? And the buttons, and this is the six, the end. So if we press the add, then it has to add the two numbers and uh, print uh, the result here. Add and subtract, there is no, you can multiply, there is no problem, does it directly. But if you do division, for example, you have to test the denominator not to be zero. Okay, with zero, we cannot make uh, divisions by zero. And if uh, it's okay, then it does the division and uh, prints the result. The same thing happens in the square root. Uh, checks if the product A by B is uh, larger than zero. If it's smaller than zero, okay, yes, then uh, it issues a message and it doesn't print it. It doesn't uh, execute it. So this is the flow chart and I'll show you a little bit of the code written behind this button, A plus B in Visual Basic. It's this one, it's written this code Okay, just uh, here it assigns memory locations to the variables A and B, and then calls a function to read the A and B from the text boxes. And this is the function for when one uh, text one put uh, the value which is in the text box in the location on memory A, and from the, the second text box in mem uh, in uh, memory location B. And then uh, we say another function, uh, write result, which is this one here, that uh, uh, sends to another function, to the function add you see here, performs the addition. The addition goes into the name of the function add. And then this uh, name of the function, uh, becomes A here in uh, uh, 
transfers the data into this variable A and uh, puts the results in the text box uh, three. And actually this A you see here is different than this A in these locations, okay? It's a, it's a local variable for this particular function. But the, these are details of the programming language. Now let's go into the artificial intelligence part. Artificial intelligence referred to the ability of machines to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. This ability is based on specific algorithms that allow the machine to learn and behave according to what it has learned. There are four different uh, families of machine learning algorithms, which differ depending on the view of the data that trains them. So that's very important to have data to train the algorithms. So we have the supervised algorithm that uh, uses data with labels and supervised the learning algorithms, not necessary to have label the data. And let's see how these data are here, okay? These are label data to recognize a cat or a dog, there is the label. And this is the unlabeled data gives the pictures without labels. Okay, and the machine has to find out that this is a cat without having a, a label to compare. Okay. So that's supervised and unsupervised. Now there is semi-supervised that uh, the some of the data have labels, some others they don't. And supervised needs a tremendous amount of data to be able to do the recognition of whatever it is there. And there is also enhanced uh, learning as autonomous artificial intelligence actor, actors that collect their own data and improve it based on the interaction of trial and error with the environment. This method promises a lot in basic research, but so far it is more difficult to use in the real world. Therefore, technology companies have made the most of their success in the real world. Sometimes if you go and try to get something from the internet, you see immediately they show you something similar you may want to be interested. And this is uh, part of the artificial intelligence there, that the system tries to understand what you are thinking, what do you want, and try to offer you uh, choices to help you for, to, make our, to make your choice. Now, artificial intelligence learning systems, you see here there is handcraft uh, knowledge which is like the computer programming. In the previous program I show you, we teach the computer how to add uh, two numbers. All right, we wrote the program with instructions how to do it. That's human intelligence given through the programming to the machine that does the task we want to task. This is one, uh, one way of uh, having artificial intelligence or learning for the system. Then we have machine learning artificial intelligence where we have a different procedure with data training and the algorithms we said before. Also machine uh, learning artificial intelligence needs uh, more computing power, which we have today, more massive data sets to make you understand this if, you, if we want to have uh, someone in Tokyo, for instance, from England being in Tokyo, and to recognize the, its face and find out who the person is. Okay, we need to have um, uh, pictures, about a thousand pictures for each person of the eight uh, about billion people living on earth. Okay, that, this is a tremendous amount of data, uh, like eight trillion, uh, say photographs of, of uh, the total population. but. This is no problem because we have uh, computing power and uh, mass uh, storage uh, devices. We have the cloud computing and now the clouds 
and we have resolved uh, to a certain degree this problem. We have also the improved machine learning algorithms, we said, and improved open source uh, code libraries that they continuously are developed. And uh, several other things, I don't want to go into detail on this. What I want to talk about is a philosophical view of artificial intelligence. The knowledge that uh, comes from human intelligence regarding data and software is stored electronically in databases worldwide. Almost anyone can access data, even in high security environments we see with the hacking, the hackers and cyber attacks. Such information is managed by machines and machines have everything they need to create their personality without having any control by humans. Machines with the right software can be instructed to acquire almost any kind of human intelligence, including human behavior, using databases with the behavioral uh, responses of billions of people. This capability is used to automate and build uh, robots to replace the workforce in industrial applications. But the problem is that uh, the potential evolution of the machine into a motivated entity sometimes that could happen uh, through the automation process. For example, artificial intelligence applications on battlefields allow machines such as drones, drone swarms, and sophisticated weapons to operate independently without human uh, control and decide how to behave. However, machines trained on the battlefield to kill people raise the question, is it ethical for people to want to kill other people and train the machines to do the job? Another question could be, is it possible for people to acquire education or intellect level to be able to resolve their differences without trying to exterminate each other and to use the intelligence and artificial intelligence of their machines to improve the quality of life. And this is the Hellenic education we, we do. The last question, is it possible to develop uh, a, morally, a, a morality of general acceptance based on science that uh, helps people uh, raise their educational and spiritual level and use their intelligence for constructive rather than destructive actions to do good and not to do evil. And again, Hellenic education does this. The answer to the last question is for people to gain internal and external balance through education and transfer it through artificial intelligence to machines, thus avoiding the acts of extermination of people and achieving a better quality of life. And uh, now going to the last part of the lecture, digital image. Everybody maybe um, tried to find out what is, how uh, we work with images. For instance, we have a camera we press a button, we get an image. But if we see the image file, we probably had, uh, see there a bunch of coins, which are uh, actually numerical values of this form, as you see here. This is a, a file of a computer image. Of course, uh, a file of computer image has also a header here. Okay, but uh, let's uh, talk about only the numerical values that represent the sage in the image. This this is an image of uh, 15 rows, as you can see here, 15 rows and 15 columns here. And uh, also here is uh, the way the computer tries to 
uh, form the image on the uh, screen by uh, taking in each dot of the screen, uh, assigning a specific gray scale value. So we have to have a gray scale, gray scale values coded like this eight uh, gray scale values from zero to seven. And then the computer reads one by one these numbers. For, for instance, uh, here are six values of seven. Seven is white, so it puts six values of white values here to form the part of the first line. Then is one, the one is this one and puts the one there. And then there are zero, zero is black. And then two sevens, okay, the last two sevens and forms the first line. The same thing happens with the se second line, etc. Let's go to the seventh line, the last, uh, uh, image element or pixel image elements they are called also pixels picture elements and short uh, expression is pixel so we have a pixel here and uh, that's the seventh one two three four six uh, seven is this one is one okay we go here this is the one okay and you see here is the 15th column of the seventh line. Okay, it's one and gets this one code there. If we want to make a image processing, like to get the negative of this image, we need to write a program to take, uh, to subtract each one of these values from seven. For instance, seven minus seven becomes a zero. So instead of white puts black. Okay, and then we can get the negative image. Uh, here is an example of a real image and the codes they have. It's a color image. A color image uh, needs uh, for each pixel three values, uh, red, uh, green, and blue RGB values. These are uh, eight bit coded values. That means each one of these has uh, codes from zero to 255. And let's, uh, these are two, the same image with two resolutions. This one has uh, 24, uh, has uh, 24 lines with 30 columns, this one, the left uh, image, and the right image has 259 uh, lines and 323 columns. You see the higher the resolution image, but it's the same painting scanned with different uh, resolution. And let's take the 25th column of this low resolution image. The values we read uh, here are this one in RGB, okay? You can see this second one, the red is dominant. So it's 226 red, okay? And the rest are smaller values. And let's take also these RGB values, put them in a file as they are here and try to get their statistics. And uh, I have a, written a program in statistics that does that. It gives us the average, the variance, and uh, the standard deviation, and this is the covariance ma matrix here. And uh, you can see that uh, the average of the red values are the largest average. The other two averages, green, blue, are about the same. But the variance, the variance gives here the amount of information being in, uh, carried by each uh, uh, picture, by each, each color, each hue, okay? The red uh, color carries uh, the largest amount of information here because it has the largest uh, variance. And the least amount of information is carried by the blue uh, color. And uh, also here are the variances in the diagonal. These are the covariances on the off, off diagonals. And here is also the correlation between them. You, you see between uh, green and uh, blue, there is high correlation but uh, the lowest correlation is between red and uh, blue in here, 0 0.6. And uh, also if we go further and take a look at the uh, flow chart that does this program, the statistics, it's the formulas I gave you. Okay, we use this flow chart for, uh, to write this uh, pr program.
And this is the end of my lecture. I think I took uh, a little bit more time, but uh, we had too much to, to cover here. And uh, I am open for questions now regarding the lecture. And if there are no questions, we can go to the lab laboratory. Mr. Coordinator, you have the floor. Open your microphone. All right, thank you. Uh, and now I give the floor to Helen. Helen. Okay, so uh, let me bring up. Can you uh, let me share my screen? Okay. Share my screen. Uh, where are you? You muted yourself. Open your microphone, Ellen. Unmute. Unmute. I'm okay. trying. To, I'm trying to share my screen, uh, but I don't see it. Let you should find. have. You should have open. It is open. It is, is it open. Press, can, put can, the cursor on the lower part of the screen, and then you see a bar there, a menu I, bar, and the green I, uh, I see icon. It. I, I see it uh, and I'm doing it, but when I open, let me see if I can find my, here we, okay. This is the, all right, here it is. <sighs> Today is not a good day for my computers. That's for sure. Uh, let me go to files. Okay, let's 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 go through till uh, Ellen uh, find the the solution. Uh, okay, uh, I could say something about Alexander uh, Alexandros Papadiamandis. I know uh, it's, uh, it's terrible that I can't. Just uh, it's not working. Ellen, so Ellen go try ahead. to go ahead. That's try to find and uh, you will continue later. Now okay. uh, the floor is mine. Uh, mm -hmm. Alexandros Papadiamandis was a wonderful painter of, of Greek nature. Um, in doubt with a, a peculiar poetic and lyrical mood, the dream of the wave verify the above view. The dream in the wave undoubtedly has elements of ethno ethnography according to its definition. The beautified id idyllic uh, representation of na natural life dominates throughout the, ma the main part of the, of the story uh, with uh, inconceivable beautiful descriptions. The carefree and poor life of, of the young shepherd who experiences happiness in the freedom, the beauty and magic of, of uh, nature. For furthermore, the reference of the agricultural works, but also the narrator's more um, More, more realistic and at the same time humorous view of the farmers, the poor widow and Moskula give the ethnographic element of the work. Maybe because the text is erotic and was in danger 
of being considered bold. The author does not sign uh, his, uh, his story, but writes on the left of side, on the left side of his uh, signature, uh, the misleading for the copy, uh, implying that he did not write it himself, but copied it from someone else. Apart, apart from uh, the uh, erotic and contemplative uh, element, it is distinguished in the short story by the author's uh, re religiosity and his love of nature, while the facts of the story take place within an idealized natural, nat natural uh, environment and in and pastoral climate. Thus, the work takes on the character of pastoral romance. The young Moscula functions as a symbol of idealized and poor love. The fenced estate of Kir Moscow seems like as the pro pro protected garden of Eden. The poor shepherd in the mountains, 18 years old, and he did not know Alpha yet, without finding it, he was happy, the perfect balance in, in nature. In nature. Uh, one evening, as he had lowered his goats down to the shore, between the rocks, he saw the beach and hoped, and he almost felt to swim. An external desire in internal balance of behavior. He went down the cliff again and reached the bottom of the sea. At that time, the sun had, had set. And at that moment, while he was taking the first step, he heard a loud banging in the sea as a body falling into the wave. He recognized her immediately in the light of the moon, the dark. He wondered the whole infinitive screen of the, of, the of the calm sea and make the waves dance phosphorescently. An absolutely inter internal balance with the nature. The sea symbolizes absolutely freedom on multiple levels, individual, erotic, and social. To live then, the, he had to, to stand up upright for a moment on top of the, do of the rock. His height would be erased for a moment high and receiving the light of the moon on the rock. From the idea of waiting here, was no other means or appeal. He decided to throw him to, to throw himself into the sea in his clothes as he was. Uh, she was like a, a, a mermaid sailing as sailing a magic a magical ship, the ship of dreams, an external balance providing a majestic scene. He would leave his Moscula, the goat, to her fate, tied up there above the rock. And it, it was the result, be tied, not to lose her as some days ago. The short rope symbolizes the various restrictions, external and internal, that are placed on the narrator's life. There was no choice but to wait. He would hold his breath. That daughter would not suspect his uh, presence. An internal balance with a vivid desire of watching, watching her. It was a pleasure, a dream, a miracle. 
Not that the idea came to him that if he stopped on the rock studying or curve with the intention of living, it was almost certain that he, the young woman would not see him and that he would be able to live normally. He was stood in ecstasy and no longer thinking about the terrestrial and external in an exaggerated external balance that made him to renounce the terrestrial. That's the main point of the story of uh, Papa Diamandis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coordinator. It was really a very uh, pleasant uh, analysis uh, right on the heart of the uh, Hellenic education uh, uh, lessons. And uh, I want to say, Helen, if you want, I can project your transparencies and tell me when you want to change them. Do you want that? Change what? My what? I can, I can project uh, on the screen your transparencies and tell me when do you want to change them so I can change them. You Are you talking about my PowerPoint that I can't show That's today? That's right. That's right. Do you want? <laughs> well, I, I don't need any to, uh, to protect them uh, in any way. I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send what I have again uh, and uh, try to solve my, pro my technical problems. Maybe you can write a program for me. <laughs> no, I, I can project on the screen and you tell yeah. us uh, the story. And if yeah. you want to change when he, uh, I can, I can uh, prepare a video. I can, pre I can prepare a video lecture and then I can send it to you. Is that what you mean for the uh, Facebook lecture? He, has, he no. has the PowerPoint. He has your PowerPoint so he can project your it. Pa pa PowerPoint. Oh, um, yeah, but I changed it, Stella. It, it's it's uh, a little bit different, but yeah, that would be fine. If you yes. have my PowerPoint, you can uh, project it. Absolutely. Dimitri, give me the, the share of the screen, Dimitri. And I will I will go through it quickly. Sure, sure. Thank you, Dimitri. Okay. Yeah, you 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 are you are co-host, Ellen. You you can you can provide it. Make make me co-host. Uh, okay. Dimitri. I I have to make you a, a, a all. Part Let me change it to all participants. Okay. I changed it to all participants. Okay. Mm -hmm. no, that's not it. Let's see. Here, here. Who's that? Okay. Okay, um, I'll go through this uh, fairly quickly because uh, Mr. Vogelis has touched on some of the most of the main points. Thankfully, he's uh, done a wonderful job doing that. Uh, uh, you probably have read a little bit about him. I'm sure many people know who he is. Uh, and so I will uh, speak briefly about uh, Alexandros Papadiamandis, his background, and his work, especially in regards to this story and our topic of Platonic and Aristotelian uh, virtues. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, he was uh, born, we can go to the next. He was born uh, after the War of Liberation um, in a world which was discovering itself as he lived during the later part of the 19th century into the 20th century, he became a man who was not obsessed, I don't wanna say obsessed, but very passionate about the past, about the traditions of the past. Uh, a very a deeply spiritual man who has been compared to Chekhov, Dostoevsky and others. Unfortunately, um, a writer who has not been well treated by the international literary world. 
I think he's uh, very unknown. He's basically unknown to the international world, apart from a very few, uh, which is, and, and that's probably a, a, it's a problem of translation, of course, into English. His works were first translated into French. Uh, his, he's a spiritual man, as I said, but his works are filled with real people, real human beings. They're listed there on the slide. Sinners, blasphemous, ambitious, thieves, gluttons, drunkards, hypocrites, etc. And we would, we would think that as we read his incredible stories, we would think that these are the people who uh, end up being judged. But no, we end up very often sympathizing with them. So his stories, we say, are filled with those who start by being the above, end up on the other extreme of scale, sainted or better, we, we should better say redeemed in some way. Next slide. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think you've already read it. There's the link. I've adapted this from this link. Um, uh, the Russian uh, literary uh, establishment has a deep reverence and respect for Papa Diamandis. I think probably and partially because of their shared, of their shared orthodoxy which uh, Russia and Greece share. So, but, but, uh, but he is revered in, uh, he's revered not so much by the, I don't wanna say he's just respected by the, rel the religious world of literature. He's respected beyond that, um, beyond that. Some of his uh, most fervent admirers are the French uh, existentialists, as a matter of fact. That's a whole other issue. Very interesting um, uh, to discuss that, but not today. Next slide. And, and the surrealists. He's also respected by the surrealist uh, authors. You've read the story, Moshula, is the name of the, the, the little, the young woman, I should say. She's a, a, not a girl, she's not an adult. She's a teen, she's a young teen. Um, Alexandros Papadimandis is writing this story as a semi-autobiographical story. He's reflecting back on his innocence, on the beauty of his life before he went to live in Athens. Uh, he's about 18 years old uh, in this situation. Moshula is probably about two years younger. So she's a young adolescent herself. Uh, interesting uh, how Papa Diamandis has a beloved little goat among his herd of goats, uh, whose name is Moshula. And of course, the young, the young girl is also Moshula. Uh, and that is part of the mystery of the story as well. Um, we can go on to the next slide. See, this is why my slides are missing. I have a, um, uh, my, uh, my new slides are missing because we wanna discuss uh, Plato and Aristotle in terms of the decisions and the thoughts of uh, the shepherd, the young shepherd. Uh, Plato is talking about emotions and how we need to control them. We need to suppress them. We need to elevate our thoughts to the ideal, to the forms. Aristotle has no issue in any of his writings. He doesn't have a problem with expressing emotions and uh, quote unquote, losing control of emotions. Uh, so uh, we have a, a difference here in terms of how these two philosophies deal with human characters in the stories that we've been reading. Let's take a look at the young shepherd. How does he, um, how, how is his idyllic life, this beautiful life that he describes in the mountains, 
with the animals in this beautiful island of Skiathos, how is his life upset? What happens to him one day to change so many things about the way he sees the world? Well, we know what happens. As he is uh, grazing his goats, he sees the beautiful sea one night and he wants to go swimming. And uh, he, at the same time, uh, he, as he, le he goes into the water, he swims, he emerges, he's going to go back up the cliff to, to get Basula, his goat that he tied up around the tree because he's afraid that she might be strangled. And what happens at that moment? He hears a splash, the, incite, the inciting moment of the story. He hears a splash, he turns around and he sees the other Moshula, the, little, the young woman. She has gone into the water. What a coincidence. She goes into the water just as he has emerged. And of course, he is transfixed. He loses somehow his sense of understanding. He's never seen a naked woman before, of course. And Muscula is swimming naked. So he loses a sense of uh, what he needs to do. He's transfixed. He feels he should leave. He should escape, he should leave because he doesn't want her to see him. But if he tries to go up the cliff, she will see him. His shadow will fall on the water as he says, and she will see him. So what does he do? He remains where he is. He is troubled. He's feeling that if he remains there shortly, she will, get, she will leave the water and she will leave and he will be safe. But then at some point, another boat approaches and she becomes frightened. And then she starts splashing and she goes down, she starts submerging into the water. So what can he do? He must jump in to save her. He jumps in, he tries trying to save her. Of course, with all of these conflicting emotions and he, uh, saves her life, only to find out later that his goat has strangled herself. So now we, we, we go into the decision-making process in the young shepherd's mind. In uh, Alexa, in, well, he's, he's talking, the author is talking about himself on the island of Scalphus, what happened to him that one time, a young, naive, innocent young man who is in love with nature, who is very respectful of people in general, especially of females. And now he has, not only has he uh, put himself into a difficult situation, uh, but he has lost one of his goats. What kind of, what would Plato say about the young shepherd? Would Plato agree or disagree with what he has done? What about Aristotle? Aristotle felt that emotions were part of human life uh, and that the emotions and the passions uh, actually can lead to a, to a deeper understanding of human life, a better understanding of human life. Plato disagreed. He felt that we need to suppress them in order to bring out what is better, what is perfect, and what is ideal. So what about the shepherd? What do you think? Have any thoughts, Stella? Even about the story or about how? Yeah. So with regard to Plato, I think he did suppress everything. And then the conflict, and maybe I'm wrong, arose when she started drowning. So now he he had no other choice so like the moral side is do i save her or do i escape with you know having everything so if he escapes she drowns so you know at that point is that would plato still agree 
that it's a moral issue because yes, he had these feelings and he was attracted to her and everything played into it. But that act of her drowning, I don't think that was mm -hmm. an external passion. I think it was like, I need to save her. And he knew in the back of his mind that if he went to save her, that something might happen to his goat at the same time. Yes, he was conflicted, but the fact that he named his goat after her, you know, it's... Yeah, that's part of the, uh, part of the, the beauty of the story is how these two names um, are, are mixed up. As a matter of fact, when I translated it, I, um, I had to change a few things to make it clear to the English readers that, that Moskula meant either the young woman or it meant the goat. Because in the, in the original story, sometimes it's difficult to tell who he's talking about. Um, but, you know, so the higher moral purpose, the higher moral purpose, I think is what you're saying, is to save another human life. It's not necessarily to, to, remain, um, to remain in complete control of his passions and, and not go into the water to save her. Uh, but it is to, to go in and try to save her. And thus, by doing that, uh, right. he's going to, of course, experience the female form. Right. Uh, so, okay. So I, I agree that that he I would agree as well. Yeah, Plato, he, what would Plato say? You know, that that's the question. Uh, I think, I think um, the, the I'm, I'm not really sure because I'm not versed in Plato very much, but I think Plato with his forms, with his ideal, idealism, with his self-discipline, with his suppression of emotions of, well, when I say emotions, I mean the passions, the, the extreme passions. I think he would say that uh, what, what, Alex, what Alexandros did was correct. I think he would say it was correct because he, he, his, when he was watching her, Mentally, he was thinking, and he writes all this, he's mentally thinking about the young woman's body and how beautiful it looks in the moonlight, et cetera, et cetera. So he's mentally thinking this. His thoughts are not thoughts of, um, of rape or taking an ex exploitation or taking advantage of the girl. His thoughts are thoughts of beauty, the ideal form. So I think that is very platonic. I think that's platonic. Um, so, but, but jumping into the water, I also think Plato would agree because he is choosing to save a life. I think saving a life is based on, not on lust or passion, but on saving somebody's, an innocent person's life would be perfectly in accord with Plato. Aristotle, uh, I don't know. What do you think, Stella? Aristotle um, is more like we need to we need to um, we need to embrace passions because our passions can also lead to a deeper understanding about who we are. If so, I read, if I understand him correctly. No, I understand. There's two ways. Like I think that. Um, when he saw her, he still indulged in staring at her because he had another means out. So I think that's where maybe I'm wrong, but maybe that's where Aristotle's, like he indulged in continuing to, to look at her. Whereas he didn't take the other, yeah, he knew that it would be a longer route. He understood that it would be a longer route and that it would take him more time, but he wouldn't be, we, he wouldn't have the pleasure of looking at her, looking at her form and seeing everything else. So he didn't, I felt that he did indulge by staying there longer uh, because he wanted the path of least resistance. I'm so glad you brought that up because when, he, when he's writing the story, when he's writing his story, he's also uh, confessing, he's telling us, revealing that he was conflicted. Should he go? Should he just leave and just say, I'm sorry, I didn't do anything. I wasn't, I wasn't going to hurt you I, I, and leave. And, and possibly have the fear of having, you know, being, atta uh, being attacked by her father, 
or should he stay and continue in this trance enjoying this incredible situation that he finds himself in and he chooses to stay he does choose to stay you're right so uh in that in that respect then he he stays he's enjoying his emotions uh and so he in that in that respect aristotle he's also conforming to aristotle's views about about you know it's 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 so interesting that um this event in his life in papa diamandis's life uh would would lead to a man who never got married uh and who was essentially you know a, who was a bachelor all of his life and uh who in many ways uh was opposed to the sophisticated life of the city where people i would say enjoy I mean, take use their passions and live inside a more uh, a, a, in a world where uh, feelings are expressed more readily than in the countryside where people are more i would say controlled and disciplined with the emotions they show of course uh, in his stories, Papa Diamandis uh, does talk about the people of the countryside, the people in the villages, the people in the in the uh, mountains and the islands who are uh, up, uh, not oppressed. I'm not. I don't want to say that, but they have to uh, live a life which is in conformity with their environment. And if they dare to try to break out of that environment like one of his stories called uh, Fonisa, the murderess, uh, you, you know, the, the, the uh, results are terrible. So, um, okay, well, uh, what about uh, Professor Hadzopoulos? Do you have any comments about the story before we close today? Oh, yes, I do. And I think uh, your analysis exactly shows uh, how the logic uh, works to put together all the feelings and thinking and uh, anything around the scene uh, in the beach. And uh, we have to understand the, this three-dimensional um, space of uh, uh, mind state I show you. And this is exactly what's going on because the emotions they are a result of the desire desire is the one that um, comes through desire and uh, creates the uh, good feeling or the bad feeling or the fear or whatever else it's it's uh, the desire and the logic uh, you know tries to compromise all these things uh, desire the cultural uh, part uh, that uh, to see an act uh, girl uh, would be you know a bad thing and tries you know all this thing is uh, what uh, logic tries to balance and uh, try to find out what to do and at the same time also the aristotelian the plato's part says that uh, logic has to be exact to uh, balance desire and anger but Aristotle says, okay, you have to be a little bit off, you know, the, the exact, to be lower and uh, to have a lower and upper limit. And so the thinking in lower and upper limit, if it's within the bounds of the mid space of virtue, then it's Aristotle. It's the same thing is approached with Plato and Aristotle, I think. And this is internal and external balance. And I think beyond that then we have the external balance the moment that jumps in the sea over there is humanitarian a heroism his uh, virtue goes close to infinite at that uh, point and uh, to save the girl of course afterwards he would uh, probably try to um, go further you know for the, for the girl so more interest that was uh, something to, to debate about uh, that uh, he was uh, doing good, he 
uh, left and he never saw any interest or he would pursue his interest. Of course, that the, the debate is because he's taking advantage of what he did, the heroism, and get the reward or not also there. And it, all, it all depends on what Moskula says afterwards to her adopted father, the, yeah. the landlord. Yeah, but yeah. we will never know. What we do know, what we do know is that Papa Diamandi soon after, as a, a young man, soon after 19, 20 years old, uh, eventually uh, did uh, continue his education and did go to Athens and left Skiathos. Skiathos. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the tension, the tension between the, the philosophers is exhibited in, I think, in all of all of the stories that I've read, anyways. Um, thank you so much for 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 including the hero, <laughs> because and, he, and the conclusion is that, uh, as we said, I said before, he when he was stunned in ecstasy and no longer thinking about the terrestrial, at that time we have Aristotelian an exaggerated external balance that made him to renounce the terrestrial. That was the point, the main point of the story. Thank you so much. Very important. I think you're right. Absolutely right. But okay. it, like many great writers, uh, Papa Diamandis is very complicated, very complex. You yeah. have to, uh, we have to read between the lines and understand the environment that he lived in. And, but uh, there is a common thread as you and, as you and uh, Dr. Hadzopoulos have told us and Stella, thank you, and you and Stella as well. There's a common thread in all of his stories and that is the tension between um, the self-discipline and control and the passion and the uh, pathos of the um, pathos of the characters. Okay. That's it for me. So yeah, I want to emphasize that uh, Plato's uh, internal balance deals uh, mostly with the logic and how to balance the desire and anger, while Aristotle uh, yeah. deals with the action. The actions must be within certain limits. Good point. Uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Good to remember that. Yes. So we we finished for tonight. Yes. We have yes. not. We have will, no, nothing I will, else. I will Ellen, send you have you something one. to say. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. I will send the slide. Okay. The new PowerPoint okay. to everybody and. Uh, announce the next story uh, later today. Uh, well, yeah, I think I, uh, I think we have analyzed the whole story tonight very well. Uh, yeah. Mr. Hadzopoulos, you you have the floor to close the lecture. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, everybody. I think uh, the particularly the analysis of the Papadiamades was really great by the work of Helen. And uh, I want to make an announcement. We are going to postpone next uh, lecture because I have some problems to, to solve on next Saturday. And we'll continue two weeks uh, from today, all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, next Saturday we shall we shall okay. not have lecture. Okay. Okay. So uh, you have to send uh, an email to Geronimus to know uh, not be awake uh, at three o'clock in, in the morning. Okay. 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 Don't don't forget it. Don't forget oh, it. I, I won't forget. Send him an email to be informed. Thank so good everybody. night for everybody. Thank you very much for tonight. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night.